Well, good morning. Happy Wednesday morning. Glad you could be here. We're just getting started. On the screen is something slightly different from what we're used to, and that is uh, the profiler in Unity. So we're going to profile something. Uh, time travel is kind of functioning. I know uh, we got stuck on Monday a little bit, but um, we have we have a, we've gotten further now. Um, so we can jump through the periods with all of the natural and the human-made things kind of appearing when they need to, which is great. Uh, but there's a gigantic spike when you're going from the Neolithic period to the Iron Age period. And currently, the Neolithic period has very few objects in it, and the Iron Age period has very many. So I suspect that's part of it. But we're going to dig into that with the profiler and see if we can get some clue as to where the big hang-up is, and then we can try to figure out some strategies for dealing with that. So um, that's some excitement. Also, I'm going to be keeping an eye on the sound outputs in the background. We don't have our normal Muse open streaming copyright free classical music today. We've got some weird plunking around on an out of tune piano, which was some noodling on the piano I recorded in a rare moment where I had the house to myself. I recorded this um, six, seven months ago now, and it was never meant for this, but uh, all told it makes about an hour and uh, as background music might be okay. I have no idea on the levels though. So uh, I'll, I'll keep adjusting and, and uh, messing around with that. Uh, we'll just see what happens. But then again, but then hopefully I won't get like notices that I'm stealing music, even though I'm pretty sure I wasn't. Anyway, silly things. So we're going to be working on the profiling here. And uh, as we can see over here in Unity, the profiler is crazy, difficult to read. Um, but here we are. So I've kind of turned everything off. I'm, I've left the memory profiler on just in case I want to see if there's some odd things happening with the memory. But today, my, my main thing is to try to figure out what's going on with the CPU usage uh, as, we, as we carry forward. So right now, we've got a whole whopping one millisecond threshold here, a thousand FPS which would be amazing if the game could run like that. But you'll see that it completely stutters and crashes um, when, we, when we actually start playing the game. So here we are in the Mesolithic period, and we're going to step through it. And you will see that we get the beach ball of death uh, once we jump from the Neo make our second jump. You'll see what happens here. And once we've made that jump, I'm going to pause the, the game and I'm going to dig into the profiler because the profiler only gives us a very short window of time to look at. So um, we're going to just look at that really fast. Well, we're going to try to catch that moment, that spike, and then dig into it a little bit more. I'm not so great with interpreting the tea leaves of the profiler. So um, this will be a learning experience for me, certainly. And Maybe you'll have a few tips or you'll learn something as well. So I'll get better at this as we move into troubleshooting and profiling and optimization. So anyway, right now we got to figure out why there's this show stopping pause. So because we're not loading anything into memory as far as I know, it's already loaded in there. So let's go ahead and press play and jump straight in here and uh, we'll see what's going on. So this beach ball of death is not the beach ball we're worried about. We can profile this later too, but I'm expecting this one. So here we are. We're off and running. Jump ahead one period. There we go. Ta-da, there's the mound. Great, now here's where it all comes crashing down. Right, it looks like there's that beach ball. And I'm just going to hit the pause button the moment I see that portal open. So it'll be a few seconds here. It doesn't look like it, but this represents success. I spent a good time, a good deal of time yesterday, wading through my own logic, trying to figure out why I was getting very strange behavior, and I learned a few things about Unity, and I learned a lot about my own scripts. There we go. Okay. 
So here's the big question, but you can just see the edge of the Iron Age Palisade, so that's pretty cool. We can see stuff, we can see the well going in there, so that's kind of fun. Um, but let's take a look and see, there's the big spike right there, um, and it goes from, <laughs> we, we head up to an absolutely gigantic spike on the milliseconds here. So let's jump through it and see what we've got. Um, see what this is. I'm not even certain what this is. So, um, so let's jump in and see what's going on. So we're just going to be paying attention to this main thread right now. If we zoom in here, we see that we've got a lot of time like 8,292 milliseconds worth of time being taken up by a script called Vertex Color Adjust Start. That's what I was thinking was going on. Because we are, in fact, it's all the Vertex Color Adjust. This script is a workhorse for me. It's also has always been a problem. So if I jump forward one, frame here. Let's keep jumping forward in frames. See, we're, we should be getting a time slice like this, a super tiny time slice. But we get this monster spike. And this monster spike looks like it's all in one script. It's a 30 second spike. Can't have that in a game. So what's happening is a number of game objects, like a lot of game objects, are getting initialized here. They've been disabled previously and now they're being enabled so all the scripts on those objects are running their start uh, are running their start function so you can see here vertex color adjust dot start parentheses so that's so for, and we can even see which game objects it's running on so like it's running on the roundhouses <laughs> the iron age roundhouses are causing us trouble if you're an experimental archaeologist you'll probably agree yeah, it's those roundhouses. Those are the ones causing us trouble. Lots and lots of trouble. In fact, I'm even killing the profiler. Yep. So, what's going on here? And there's 15 instances of this. So, uh, well, I mean, there's so many more than 15 instances. But it seems to be pretty much that script giving us the trouble. So that's a good thing to know. Um, so let's go jump into the vertex color adjust because I suspect there's something going on in the start where it's grabbing all the vertices in the mesh. Let's take a look. So here it comes. Here we go. Whoa, the sunrise is really stunning this morning. There's a few clouds in the sky, and so they're beautiful. You've got bands of yellow and blue and orange and pink. It's really, really lovely. Very nice. All right, here's our vertex color adjust. This old thing is a massive workhorse, but also it causes me tons and tons of trouble, and I will probably move away from this script uh, going forward. It kind of is meant to be a vertex color, uh, all things to all people, and there's a few things it does. It controls dithering, it controls um, invisib in invisibility or transparency, a lot of things, and a lot of those are set on, on the vertex level so per vertex so what this does is it grabs a copy of the mesh 
and it um, runs through all the vertices and assigns each vertex its different attributes. It, it either resets the UVs dynamically, which is how the dithering is done, or it um, sets the vertex colors dynamically. And that's fine for meshes that just have a few hundred or even just a few thousand verts. But in the Iron Age, we're dealing with meshes that have thousands of verts because we're working on actually some relatively high poly count for this project, high poly count objects, and it's trying to do this dynamically and it's not liking it. So there's a few things going on here. This is our start function right here. So a um, few things going on. Let's leave this, this if statement here in this pre-populated Boolean check. Let's leave that aside for a minute because I think this is going to be the answer to our problems as well as the cause. Um, so what is it doing? It's setting a just a simple color variable. That's OK. It's setting, uh, it's creating a new array, a new color array that's equal to the number of vertices in a mesh. OK, that could be a little bit of trouble. Um, if the multicolored flag is checked, it's running through and it's setting our new colors array. So this is an empty array equal to the vertex length in the mesh. This one, if it's multicolored, that's a flag I have to prevent overwriting the coloring um, that gets imported. And so if it ticked as multicolored, then it populates that new mesh with a copy of the colors out of the mesh. Um, because when we're changing mesh colors, we've got to change it on a copy before assigning that copy back to the mesh. Um, so it works through that. It runs the set color function, which is expensive. Sets another couple of small variables, that's okay. If it's set to be invisible first, it actually does um, it does a fade, it does a tween fade. It fades the thing out, it fades it out in zero seconds. It just does one frame. It also creates another array, a blank array of UVs, which is again equal to the length of the mesh. And then it runs the set UVs. So there's a, there's a lot. So the start function is not just running start. It's actually running set color and set UVs as well. So let's go down and take a look at what set color and set UVs looks like. Here's our set color function. Sets one little variable, no big deal. Then it loops through the entire new colors array and it sets every item in that new colors array which is a color, so that's a vector four. It sets that to the saved color. Um, and then it sets all of the colors in the mesh. Yeah, then it reassigns the mesh colors with this new colors. Um, so that's a pain. And then it also runs, start also runs the set UVs. Set UVs does the same thing. It's going to run through and it's going to assign all the mesh UVs to our new array. So it's looping through every vertex in the mesh for every one of the meshes on the roundhouses at least. Uh, it's looping through them four times, maybe more. And it's doing that for many, many objects all at once, dozens of objects. So that's our 30 second spike. I don't need it to do that. So one thing I've been doing to try to cut down on time spent when a game object wakes up and its start function is called. One thing I've been doing is I have this pre-populate start. So there's a, I've got an editor script that's done at editor time that if I just tick this pre-populated box, well, no, if I, there's a script that I run and it goes through and it finds every game object in the scene that isn't what's called pre-populated and it runs this. And what this does is in editor time, um, it actually takes care of all of these functions that happen at start. It does it in the editor and it saves it into the mesh. So it sort of bakes 
my start function into my mesh or bakes it into my object really because this is working with a mesh but I've got this pre-populate running on lots of different types of scripts. That means that when we, if this is already run, when we start it up, um, it skips the entire start function, which is really, really good. The problem is, is this is a bit of a blunt instrument. So I should run this pre-populate on start editor script every time I bring in a new asset and I get it all set up and I get it just the way I like in the scene, I should run it and take care of all of this at one time. Um, because my editor script, I think either does it object by object or it does it for the entire hierarchy. Um, I can't remember. I can't, I'd love it if it did it object by object, but I'm not sure if I was that clever. So let's jump into Unity and see what's going on here. We can also cheat this. So let's turn off the play that was paused. Here we go. And let's um, put something pretty on the, pic on the page so that you can enjoy that. Let's go look at our roundhouses. Let's look at their vertex color adjust script. So we can cheat this. We don't even have to run the pre-populated script in the editor just to test things. Instead, we can just check this pre-populated checkbox and uh, the game will think that it's already run this, this script, the, the start. It'll basically tell us to skip the start function. So we should give that a try. We should also look through all of our game objects in this scene that we know we're going to be loading up and unloading um, to see which ones have the pre-populated check already checked and which don't. The ones that already do are legitimately kind of baked in. The ones that don't aren't, but we can try to keep track of this and just see what's going on. So let's see what doesn't have a pre-populated checkbox on its vertex color adjust script. So we know it's the roundhouses. And this will be attached to anything that has a mesh in the roundhouses. And the roundhouses have three to four meshes in them. No, just three. The whole roundhouse is one object. And then uh, the doors are separate objects because I thought maybe I would want to animate those doors. I think that's probably very silly. So let's grab all of these. Okay, none of their scripts have that pre-populated on there. So I'm gonna tick that box. Now they all think they are pre-populated, so that's a good thing. Basically every new object that we brought into the scene that has a vertex color adjust assigned to it will be running into these problems. Some of them don't have that assigned, like the, the well planks and things like that. So let's just keep digging. Easy traffic early in the morning here in town. I apologize for that. Ooh, the ramparts don't have the vertex color adjust on them. That's really nice. Or the palisades, I mean. That's good. What about our barrow? Nope. Neither does our barrow. Marvelous. What about our birch trees? No, none of them do either. Good, good, good. So we're just making sure that none of these meshes have this thing on them and they don't, so that's all really good. Good. Okay, so in the Iron Age period, the whole thing that was was causing us trouble were these roundhouses. Let's just go look in the Neolithic really quickly. 
that's not causing us trouble. I have a suspicion that stuff in the the church in the Anglo-Saxon period is going to be causing us trouble. No, it's not. Good, because none of them have the vertex color adjust script on them. So that's really nice. I know I had to stick it on a few objects that were just not rendering correctly when they were coming in. But I might have assigned it, and then once it's set my vertex colors in the scene, I might have pulled it out of there. Which would be pretty fun. Should be a good thing to do. All right. Well, shall we give it a shot? Let's see what happens. Um, anything in the Mesolithic running this? Like the Shigir Idol? No. Okay. Fingers crossed, let's see what happens. I'm just gonna save this because we may crash it. Save, save, save. So many objects now in this to save. Definitely getting close to time to rebuild this whole scene, make it a little more efficient. But we really didn't know the full shape of the problem until uh, until we got this far. Okay, the leaves are fluttering. That's great. The profiler is profiling. Uh, flex capacitor flexing. Okay, here we go. Boom. Straight into the Iron Age. Come on. Did I miss my spike? No, we're doing great. Um, yeah, straight into the Iron Age. Let's do it again. We'll watch the profiler. So that was pretty good. That's much more like what it should be. We have this big bump at the beginning when it starts running on some other scripts and it can't be avoided, but we can maybe fix it a little bit later. Okay, here we go. Jump one, no problem. Jump two, no problem. Pause the game. Look at our profiler. Tiny little bump up to a whopping five milliseconds. Um, this is not how fast the game is. That would be awesome if the game was this efficient. It's just that I've turned off all the other stuff um, in the profiler. If we really, if we turn on rendering, we see we jump up to 10 milliseconds. That rendering spike is caused uh, by the script spike. We turn on the physics, we keep pushing up. Animation, there shouldn't be any garbage collection. V-Sync's going all over the place. Global illumination, there shouldn't be any. And then the UI. So actually, we're still staying really nice and lean, which is nice to see. Uh, let's turn off all of this stuff. Let's not look at the rendering issues right now. Instead, let's jump. And interesting when we jump, when we jump periods because we're turning on and off objects, um, we can see we actually get a dip in memory, which is pretty exciting. That's a good thing. Okay, so now the big culprit. We're looking for this kind of bluish color. The big culprit. Uh, we could try to squeeze some more frames out of this, but honestly, I don't care um, because. It's a very short spike here. Um, is the time travel cheater? Seems to be the big spike. And we've got another like game object activate because we are activating a bunch of game objects and that always gives us a hit. Um, anytime you access game object, you're causing trouble. Um, so really it's just our time travel cheater script that's causing trouble and it's running at 13.87 milliseconds. I'm cool with that. So that's our big spike and it's just the update in Time Travel Cheater. So we can go take a look at that. Time Travel Cheater, it's the update function which is right here. Well, it's longer than that. It's this whole bit. And I don't know why it's causing some trouble here. Use cheat time travel dates count bigger. Those are just some quick checks. Sets the counter up. Runs open portal. Open portal here. This is the problem. And I suspect this is the problem 
and then it's sending this message and it's sending this message but after waiting for half a second so I don't know if that's thread blocking or not um, but anyway there so we just shaved off 30 seconds practically um, out of that big spike in, in the render time so yes so now we know we can file that away in the back of our memories we can file that once again the vertex color adjust script is causing us a heck of a lot of trouble why do we need to keep it around well like I was saying the vertex color adjust script does a few things for us It sets the vertex colors for all of the meshes, and if we wanted to change mesh color, including the alpha of each vertex, then uh, we would want to do this dynamically in the mesh instead of doing this in the mesh's material, because if we do it in the mesh's material, every single mesh suddenly becomes its own draw call, and that really slows down performance as well. So we're trying to keep it to as few materials as possible, which means you have to make adjustments on the mesh itself, which is great for, like I said, low vertex meshes, but bad for high vertex meshes. The main thing that we're getting out of this is that there is a fading or a dithering option that's going on in here. Um, we can actually fade things out based on camera viewpoint which is kind of fun um, because it allows you to kind of see through walls of buildings. That's being run on the UVs of the mesh and it's being run per vertex and I don't know how to get out of that. Um, generally speaking, we can, we can set it to run only on the meshes we want it to run on. Um, so like for these Iron Age houses, I might if we jump into the scene here. I do really love that spread out mound, all those little rocks, gotta say. Okay, so for these little houses here, um, if we jump into wireframe view, you can see that, you know, we can see each individual, we can see each individual post, we can see all the little rafters, and that's really fun. Um, so for these, you know, I would be tempted I'd be tempted to make like the roof thatch ditherable, but not the rest. So, cause that's where you would see really the, that's where the most striking um, features of this house are. So, you know, I might be tempted to do that. I can see I've got something going on wrong in here. This topsoil shouldn't be here. So there's something still going on wrong in our time traveling. What a surprise. This shouldn't have grass in it either. There shouldn't be grass around that. So we gotta figure out why certain bits of our landscape are still rendering. Anyway, so we may greatly reduce our vertex color adjust script so that it's only dealing with kind of UVs and only for that fading and only on objects we want. We'll be much more targeted in the effect we want. This is good. I'm really glad we've gotten this far. What I'm not so glad about is that we're not getting our topsoil to kind of go on and off. I see we've moved over to a different song. <laughs> um, this will go on for another half hour and then it'll repeat maybe. I can just see it just registering very quietly. That's good. Okay, so getting back to this at hand. Um, so there's some optimization to be doing here. I've got to figure out why the landscape isn't going away or coming in like it should. Uh, but now we can jump through time periods without beach balling, and that's great. And it's just those roundhouses. And we fixed it just by ticking that box. We could probably remove the vertex color just script entirely, but it's doing very little damage now. So that's good. Okay, let's figure out why the land
landscape tiles aren't doing what they should when we're changing times. So that's very puzzling to me. And maybe it's, we'll have to see which ones it is, because this may be less puzzling once I, once I realize that this soil info script should not belong on this, because it's, it's forcing, it's forcing these tiles to um, turn on and off when I don't want them to. So we'll, we'll jump in this. Um, we make our second jump, jump to the Iron Age. These topsoil tiles should turn off, but I bet they won't. So let's keep an eye on that little checkbox and let's keep an eye on these if they go from this brighter blue to a faded out blue. Let's find out. So we can fix the, the starting load time issue as well. Um, we can profile that just for kicks. So there's one. Okay, these are still on. And they're not blue because we're in play, so they're not prefabs anymore. Okay, um, Iron Age. Okay, they have turned off. Let's jump. So those guys have turned off. They've done exactly what they should do. Let's pause it. Let's go look around and see what else we've got going on. So it's a Neolithic topsoil. Those are going on, that's fine. Um, but they should be in a different layer. Your time B and the Iron Age topsoil should be time A. That's correct. Well, actually, you know what? They're showing up here. Yeah, we're fine, but they're not showing up in the game. I can see that there's dirt over there. We've got dirt here. I guess that should be filled with dirt. Okay. We're good, actually. All that stuff's working. Marvelous. That's very exciting. All right. Oh, it's so nice to have that moving quickly again. Okay. Well, let's, uh, what's the next thing we should do? The next thing we should do is set this aside and uh, get back in and jump into the medieval landscape. So let's put some more strain on the old computer here. Fire up yet another thing. The wind's really kicking up now. It's gonna be one of those days. So there's our medieval landscape. Um, we've booleaned it back to where it should be. Now we've got to chop it into our 20 tiles. That'll be fun. And then um, split it all up. Extrude down our edges here. I think we've only got like a seven centimeter gap or some super ridiculously tiny gap. Uh, let's find out. Let's see how much I actually moved that. I'm going to turn our snapping on. We're going to go to our tools and our measure and construct tools. One. moving in here. Seven point one five centimeters. Okay. Good. That's the distance we've got. We should probably write that down. I'm gonna write it down here on my handy paper. Seven point one five centimeters. Alright. Will we understand what that is? No. Okay, so we've got our paths, our medieval paths. 
kind of coming up to the hilltop site here through the original Iron Age entrance. We've got kind of a lesser path going off the back of the hill. <clears throat> Pardon me. Okay, let's split up our topsoil. So what we're going to do is we're not going to split the topsoil, but we're going to um, select the edges every 20 squares across and um, up. And then we're going to select the entire outline and we'll extrude all of those down 7.15 centimeters. And then we will just take the top level. We'll just take those top level ones, uh, verts. We'll just select those and we're going to randomize them a little bit so that the top soil doesn't look smooth like this. Uh, Cause this is going to be grass. It's going to be bumpy to kind of represent grass tufts and things like that. Um, so it's a bit of a process. And then we'll split everything up into 20 meter sections. And then we'll make sure that we're not, that our extrusions are only going down to the landscape. And then we'll export it into Unity. And I doubt we'll get that far in the next half hour, but we can give it a try. I'm very pleased that we made progress though today. That's really nice to see. Okay, so, um, I think probably I can just work with the topsoil itself. Okay. So let's start selecting lines, edges. Okay, every 20. So starting at this one, one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. There's one, and we'll tidy it up. As we get through here, it'll start going a little bit odd. We'll, we'll tidy that up. We'll go here. So hard to do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. So like for this one, we've got to turn off this group. There we go. Go back to my loop selection. I just wanted to make sure that there were actually 20 um, squares here and I hadn't miscounted and I haven't miscounted. So that's great. So now we're just gonna go in and brush this up. Grab this line, for example. And down here, grab just that. I'm gonna get rid of this one put this one in, get rid of that one and that one.
Okay, so I've got my five slices across, and I've just got to do three slices up now. So starting on that one, one. finish it over here, but let's keep going up. I guess four slices we're actually slicing it into. So starting at that one. Okay. Let's keep going. This should be our last one, maybe. Maybe not. Just going to double check that I've only got twenty squares here. One, two. Yes, good. So we need to get rid of this. That one's going through fine. I'm really excited that we have the basic part of time travel there functioning in the game now, because it means we can get closer to actually producing a demo. Um, <laughs> really nice. So um, maybe even on Friday, we might get as far as um, working with the actual gameplay a little bit um, and porting everything over that we had built before um, getting that all kind of situated and nestled into the game uh, the whole game the whole period of time that we're dealing with there's still some time periods to model uh, so there's still some content to put in but we might want to focus on getting the code working to support it since uh, since we're getting pretty close now so that's a nice thing to see and once we get the demo finished, we've got to work on ideas of efficiency and things like that. We're going to be streaming tiles, um, so we have a streaming system. We're going to do all sorts of things because this is ending up being a really big project. But one little bit at a time. <coughs> Pardon me. Went on a run this morning in the cold. Okay, so there's that. Um, let's convert this selection. Uh, actually, let's save this selection. Set selection. Linear tile edges. Okay. Good. Now let's move this edge selection. Let's convert it to a vert selection. And then let's go in and connect all of these verts. And I don't think I can grab them. as a boundary loop because they're going to do this, but yeah, be, that's okay. They're going around all the paths and we don't want that, but we can clear those out easily enough. Here we go. I thought I had a stray one there. I don't. That one's working fine. the wind 
causing my office here to creak. We have epic, epic windstorms over here. I guess that's what you get for being at the foot of the Rockies, and we're kind of at we're kind of at the exit of a of a bowl of the Rockies. We're covered on three sides by fairly substantial mountains, but the fourth side is open, so the wind just comes rushing down there and finds its exit off of the fourth side of our valley. Anyway, all the trees grow sideways here. Folks are always surprised when they come on a not windy day and then it turns windy. Um, they all wonder. They're all surprised if it's windy here, but if you look at the trees, you'd know. All right, let's set this selection here. Let's call it all tile edges, just so that in case I am silly and I lose that selection, uh, we can get it back again. All right, now we're going to extrude these edges. Okay, they've been extruded. And then let's move them down by 7.15 centimeters. Let's see, how are we gonna do that? I'm gonna convert my selection to points, and then we'll run the set point value command. And the Y, we're going to go negative 7.15. Did that do the trick? Mm, that set it in the world. We don't want that. Hmm. Maybe I can't do it that way. Just do it straight in here. Ooh, that worked. Let's turn off our hierarchy. Well, it worked here. Yeah, it makes a nice level seal there. Not so much here on the edge, but that's okay. We can go through and adjust that later. Okay, well, brilliant. Okay, so ooh, we've got another thing. This is great. So let's set this selection, save this selection and call it Lower tile edge, verts, whatever. It's okay, the naming's not too important. Basically, um, what the, all these uh, verts that are selected right now are kind of the opposite of what I want to have selected. Um, I want to have all the top ones, but not all the bottom ones selected, but that's great. So I'm just gonna run an invert select command. Okay, and now we're going to run a randomize command. So we're going to crumple them axially. We're going to crumple them on their y-axis. We're only going to crumple them by about four centimeters. And we're not going to do it in and out. Let's see what happens here. So that added some randomness to it, but not really enough. So let's hit it again. Uh, in and out would have made them move on their y-axis up and down, and since this is such a thin layer of soil here, um, I didn't want to do that. Ooh, actually, I didn't want to do that anyway. And I'll show you why. 
um, because I would have been, yeah, I would have been altering this, and this is already kind of the edges of the soil here are exactly where I want them to be. So I've got to deselect all of these edge pieces again, so bear with me while I do that. And I don't have to be super precise on this, so like those ones that are really close together, I can just go ahead and deselect those, because if they don't need to move, So this is kind of our medieval soil base, and I want to have this in place so that we can get to the church as well, so we can kind of bridge the gap and get to the area where we've already done quite a bit of work. There'll be a few other things we do. So there's that one burial platform in the Mesolithic that has collapsed, and we'll make that interactable. It'll just be a one-click interaction, but it'll be something for the user to do, and it will reveal an artifact that they can collect. And the artifacts are important because they're the keys to time travel. And this one's going to be kind of a tutorial. It's going to teach something about the way artifacts behave in different time periods. So it'll be a nice little thing to do. But anyway, it'll be nice to be getting all of these different systems in the game, the building system, the time travel system, the artifacts, inventory, even the sound system. Um, it would be really nice to get working on the audio again. I've, I've made kind of forays into all of these different areas, but I haven't really done a good job of joining them up. So we're going to join them up. Uh, start joining those things up, and that will be really great. Okay. All right, I've got everything set here, so I'm going to set this selection again. Okay, so that's overwritten the previous one. Okay, so let's hit this with a randomize. Okay, we're going to crumple it. We're going to crumple it four centimeters positive x value this time. So we'll apply it. So we did it once. Great. I want to do it again. I think I did do it again. Yeah, so we can keep randomizing it, but we don't want to do that so much. That's the first one. So we will hit. Actually, it's not even done the first one yet. That's OK. Um, that's our first. So just want to make sure. Sometimes when you undo, you know, you, you undo too far and you sometimes can't tell. Okay, so let's apply it one time. Okay, let's do it again and see what that looks like. Pro 
probably good enough for me. Let's try one more time. See what this looks like. We don't want that. Yeah, that looks too much, I think. If we go down, down, and maybe we can even do it that smooth. I don't know if that's gonna show up very well. Let's do that one. Okay, great. We're doing really well here. So the next thing we need to do is we need to split this into separate tiles. I honestly didn't expect to get this far in like 15 minutes. So way to go. Congratulations us. We're doing it. Okay. So I'm going to duplicate this and I'll show you why in a moment. use this one as our base and we use this one we're going to go into just soloing the hierarchy and what I'm wanting to do let me think about this for a moment let's go into edge mode And change our display to hidden lines. Very good. Okay, so this one, okay, this one, I don't know. We're going to start splitting. Why I have two is because I want to use one as the basis of my grid here. Let's just see what we can do. Split that out. Oh, hang on just a minute, guys. Hold on. Well, you'll never guess what that was. Bins. Okay. Let's uh, let's carry on. I'm just wanting to see if I manage to get my edge tiles on this when I split this one off. If I manage to get uh, not the edge tiles but all the edge pieces. So let's take a look. And it looks like I did. It looks like I got all of those edge pieces. That's great. That one can get turned off, and let's jump back in here. We may only need to have this one on. Let's find out. Okay, let's switch back. Mm -hmm. Let's turn this one on too. Okay, this one and this one. Nope, not this one. These two go on. They're in viewport solo hierarchy. Great, okay, marvelous. That's not really helping. Hmm. Fine, let's just hit the restore selection. There we go. Okay, let's grab all of these edges. Just those edges. Get rid of those guys. And split them out. Restore the selection. Select all of these edges. I'm going to have to tidy this up here. I 
know it doesn't look like it, but I've gotten much faster. Uh, at splitting out my landscape tiles. Because I used to do a thing where I'd split the tiles out and then I'd realize I have to sculpt them a little bit or whatever, or I'd... Especially on these um, grass tiles, these topsoil tiles, I'd split them all out and everything and then realize that uh, I hadn't made it kind of bumpy and then it doesn't work if they're individual tiles. Then I'd have to redo all of my work kind of got the process down now. I should probably write it down though, because I'll stop doing this and then I'll come back months later and have to do it again for another section. And um, it won't be great. tile with the path kind of wiggling in and out of it a couple times. Just to make sure we get just the bits of landscape we want. No, not that. Here we go. Okay, halfway there. up really quickly. There we go. Split it out. Okay, five more tiles to do. there. Got everything? Yeah, good. The last section. put away topsoil six. Yeah, good. Turn off my hierarchy there. Turn off topsoil eight. Yeah, 
There we go. All right. Now it's just tidying up the naming. We might on Friday, since we've got the, <clears throat> the time travel system working fairly well now, at least for now, um, on Friday we might go back to that um, platform, that burial platform in the Mesolithic, and we might set up the, uh, set up what's needed in order to uh, have the have the player reconstruct it just by clicking on it and set up everything that's necessary for the animation for those pieces to kind of go back to where they should. It would be a little bit tedious because I kind of wasn't intending that at first, but um, I think it would be kind of a nice touch now. Give the player kind of something to rebuild in most periods. Also, we need to put some more trees and stuff in the Roman and the Neolithic periods as well. So, We can just go tile by tile now and um, tidy all of this up, which we can do. But uh, it's 7.30 now, so time for me to go in, and I think that's a good place to stop. We've had pretty good success today, so I'll just save that file. And um, that's it. I'll uh, see you on Friday when we might be into rebuilding Mesolithic excarnation platforms. We'll see if I can get this medieval topsoil stuff sorted out by then. So we won't have to bore you with that. Okay, well, it's been a success, and I've really enjoyed it. I hope you have too, and enjoy the rest of your day. See you later.